Um, and some of this information is, um, I think, familiar to you, but because we have such a diverse audience here, it's, um, you know, I wanted to give some background um, on lung cancer and really uh, how important it is for us to understand lung cancer and to be doing the research that we're doing. Um, so I think many of you are familiar with um, this, this type of data, which really highlights that lung cancer is very common. Um, it's very common in the United States. This is the latest data from 2017 um, and showing that lung cancer is the second most common cancer in the U.S., um, causing about 200, um, 220 to 225,000 cases every year in the United States. And actually worldwide, it's about 1.8 million cases of lung cancer each year. So it really is a huge, um, I would say, public health burden, um, and one that often it's not recognized by, um, I would say, many people that this is such a common, common cancer. And then this slide just highlights that um, when we look at mortality from cancers, you know, lung cancer has historically been one of our tougher cancers to treat. And so this is a very deadly cancer, and this really this slide highlights that when we look at all of the cancers um, and deaths from these particular cancers, um, lung cancer causes the most um, cancer-related deaths. You can see at one quarter or more of cancer-related deaths. So it's not the most common cancer in the United States, but it's the most common and cause of cancer-related death, and that is true worldwide as well. Fortunately, what I hope to show you today is that we're finally making really, you know, huge strides to improve on these statistics. So I wanted to show you some of the latest data that we have, and I want to make two points in particular um, about lung cancer. And this is some of the latest data that we've seen on lung cancer incidents, and particularly in <coughs> never smokers. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the fact that smoking is the major risk factor for lung cancer. I think what often surprises people, including patients, is that even never smokers can have lung cancer as well. Um, and this is the data that just was published just a month or two ago, looking at this question of whether or not lung cancer in never smokers is increasing. Because many of my patients, some of you are here today, have asked me that as well. Um, you know, do never smokers have lung cancer and is that increasing? Um, and I would say yes, we actually have some evidence that lung cancer in never smokers is increasing. This is data from three U.S. institutions looking at the incidence of lung cancer um, overall and in never smokers in particular. And what you can see um, is that uh, over the years, um, almost three decades now, there has been an increase in never smokers with lung cancer starting at about 8% um, back in the 1990s and now close to 15% of our patients with lung cancer will have no smoking history. So. As, as we all like to say, I often hear Dr. Sequist saying that, you know, anyone who has lungs can have lung cancer, and I think that's a very important point that we want to make. The second point I want to make is, is this problem, and again, I know many of you are familiar with this, but there is really a huge funding gap um, for lung cancer research um, in this country, and I would say worldwide as well. Um, and this is, the, again, the latest data that we have. It's data about NIH funding for uh, cancer research. It's the data from 2016. And it's looking at the number of NIH research dollars per cancer death. And what we can see is that really lung cancer has the lowest um, amount of dollars spent for, per lung cancer death at about $1,500 per lung cancer death. Um, as opposed to close to $20,000 per breast cancer death. And of course, we need funding across all of these cancers, but I would advocate that we really need to have more funding dedicated to lung cancer specifically. So now I want to turn to just some general paradigms and, and sort of the treatment of lung cancer. And again, um, I know many of you are familiar with this, but really what we've seen over the last 15 to 20 years uh, is a huge amount of progress in terms of our understanding of lung cancer and the basic idea that lung cancer is not a single disease. In fact, lung cancer is many different diseases. And we began to understand that even in the early 2000s, 
when we were looking at the lung cancers under the microscope, and we could tell that some lung cancers were small cell lung cancer, whereas more of them actually looked more like non-small cells, and that merely describes how they look, how these cancer cells look under the microscope. So we all already had a very rudimentary classification of lung cancers back then based on just the size of these cancer cells. And then now we have more what we call histologic identification of the types of lung cancers, and in particular for the non-small cell lung cancers, we know about adenocarcinomas, which are the most common squamous cell carcinomas and large cell carcinomas, and so another what we call histologic classification of these lung cancers. And knowing this does have an impact for the types of chemotherapies that we may choose to provide, uh, recommend. However, what we've really seen is that, in particular, for the adenocarcinoma subset of non-small cell lung cancer, we have a much, much more sophisticated understanding now of the genetics of the lung cancer. And this is really what has revolutionized this field over the last 10 years or so. And so this is a pie chart that summarizes all of the known cancer-causing genes that can be activated in non-small cell lung cancer, particularly adenocarcinoma. And the pie chart gives you a sense of the relative proportion of patients who may have one of these activated oncogenes. And you can see that actually over half of patients now are known to have a potential oncogene that's driving the growth of their cancer. And so usually when we talk about these, we refer to these as oncogenic drivers. This refers to an oncogene that's now been activated through a mutation, a specific mutation or rearrangement. And now this lung cancer is being stimulated to grow because of this activated oncogene. And this turns out to be a really important point, that the oncogene is driving growth. Because if we can shut off that oncogene, you can have a very significant impact on, on, this pa on the patient's disease. And just to show you a real example of this, this is a patient of mine who has ALK-positive lung cancer. We're looking at CAT scans and axial images through this patient's chest. And you can see the lungs here, um, which really should look primarily um, black because of the air in the lungs. But in fact, this patient's lungs are full of cancer, as shown by the white areas throughout. And this patient went on a targeted therapy, was able, which was able to shut off ALK. And you can see uh, this patient's response at a, after a relatively short period of time. And this is really classic um, for what we call oncogene addiction. These cells are really addicted to the activated oncogene. And now we've had met lots of success um, in terms of identifying the different oncogenes. Only six of them are shown here. And the reason these have been so exciting is because we have these targeted therapies geared for each of those oncogenes. And you can see just some of those different targeted therapies that I have listed here below each one. So really the idea is that we want to identify the key oncogenic driver for each patient if we can. And once we know that, then our, our hope is we can pair them with the best and most effective targeted therapy. Now, many of those drugs that I just showed you here um, have now become standard therapies, and in fact, many of the clinical studies um, that were done um, leading to approval of these drugs were actually done here at MGH. And some of you may know this, Dr. Sequist has led many of the EGFR studies um, that have led to approval, including um, the most recent approval here for afatinib. Um, and we also have led many of the ALK and ROS1 studies um, leading to approval of many different targeted therapies like crizotinib, seritinib, and electinib. Um, <clears throat> And so now what I'd like to do before we turn to our panelists, um, because of course I think it's gonna be really important for everyone here to hear from them directly about their research, but I'd like to actually highlight three um, sort of themes that I think are really emerging as really exciting areas um, in this field. I was at the AACR meeting a few weeks ago, that's the Ameri American Association for Cancer Research meeting, and it was down in DC. Um, and this brings together um, cancer researchers actually from around the world. Um, and it was a really great meeting. It was the largest one yet, about 22,000 uh, people who attended. And I would say that at that meeting, it was really palpable how much excitement there is in the field because of all of these new uh, discoveries um, that have really led to um, 
really groundbreaking therapies. And so I want to highlight just three common areas um, before we turn to our panel discussion. The first has to do with drug resistance. And I think many of you here are familiar with um, the fact that MGH has really uh, focused a lot on understanding why patients respond to targeted therapies and then at some point will relapse. And that typically is due to what we call drug resistance. And so this is an example of what happens. This is a patient with ROS1 who had responded very well to crizotinib, which is a targeted therapy for both ALK and ROS1. You can see how well all of this white area here, which represents her cancer, how it almost essentially resolved once she went on to the right targeted therapy. But then after a period of time, that cancer actually all grew back. And that's the phenomenon that we call resistance and what we've been trying to understand and overcome um, in, the, in the lab and in the clinic. Um, so we're going to spend just a couple of slides talking about this problem. And you'll hear a lot about this from Dr. Hada himself, who has led many of the basic research studies on drug resistance. So I won't go into this too much, but this is um, what uh, we've been working on in collaboration with Dr. Hada and previously with Dr. Engelman in the lab. Um, and the idea here is that we have been able to study resistance not simply through uh, laboratory-based models, but actually from patients themselves. And uh, here we have learned an incredible amount about what drives resistance, and most of this has come from actually doing biopsies on patients when their cancers begin to develop resistance, then studying those biopsies um, in the lab and trying to understand what are the molecular factors driving resistance, how can we overcome those, can we come up with therapeutic strategies that we can first test in the lab with Dr. Hada's help and then bring some of those therapeutic strategies into the clinic um, and test in patients. And so you'll hear more about this process from Dr. Hada as well as the other panelists. What I wanted to mention just as a highlight of how much the research we do on resistance can really lead to new drugs is, is this one example on a new drug called lorlatinib. Lorlatinib is our newest ALK and ROS1 inhibitor. It's what we call a third generation targeted therapy. Um, it's a very different uh, molecule compared to the first generation inhibitor, crizotinib, as you can see here. It was developed by chemists at Pfizer, and pretty early on, we actually started working with this molecule in the lab to understand how active it is against cancer cells, especially against cancer cells that have become resistant to crizotinib and other targeted therapies. And this is just some data looking at the structural binding of this molecule to its targets and some of its activity in, in, the, in the lab against specific resistance mutations. We did a lot of work um, at the time that was done with um, Jeff Engelman as well as others um, here at the Cancer Center. And actually, once we had all of this preclinical work um, done to show that there was really promising activity of this new drug against resistance, we actually worked um, to open a phase one trial that's been led here at Mass General. This is a patient, actually many of you probably know this patient. She has been on a number of different clinical trials for her ALK positive lung cancer. Um, and she actually went on to lorlatinib now about three years ago when her cancer started to grow again. You can see an area of her cancer right here. And um, after just you know a few months again of lorlatinib, you know really remarkable response um, where most of her cancer has responded and resolved. In fact, um, and this and as I said, she now continues on this drug, doing very well at, at three years. And so we had both preclinical data supporting how active this drug was, and now emerging data from the clinic that this drug actually can overcome resistance. And so all of the work over many years now, uh, much of it here at MGH, has led to this current approach that we have, um, not just for ALK, but also for other types of lung cancer as well, for example, EGFR or ROS1, others, where we now actually use different targeted therapies in sequence. And we pick these different targeted therapies, oftentimes based on what's driving the resistance. So again, really knowing and understanding the resistance has allowed us to tailor these drugs, um, I think, in the most effective way for our patients. And now lorlatinib, as I said, is showing a lot of activity in patients who have become resistant. And in fact, 
just to highlight um, you know, how quickly we can move when we have really a good understanding of the biology. We have a great um, you know, collaborator in terms of the drug companies and these new molecules. How fast we can move to FDA approval. This is lorlatinib, which was synthesized, as I said, um, by Pfizer. We had first activity in the clinic um, seen as early as 2014, and we reported it at our big annual meeting in 2015. Based on the encouraging results, we then went into phase two testing, which means really focusing in on how active the drug is against the cancer that's now completed. We actually um, working again with um, Jeff Engelman and others um, like Aaron in the lab now even have an understanding of what drives resistance to lorlatinib because we always want to stay one step ahead of resistance and be able to think about what all the next options could be. And then just yesterday um, we received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA for the development of this drug and we're anticipating even before the phase three trial has completed that this drug will become another FDA approved drug a standard therapy for patients with ALK and ROS1. So really, you know, about a three and a half, four year time frame when we have a good biology, a good drug, and we have the ability to get these drugs moved very quickly through the clinic. So that's the first topic. I then want to move to a second topic of what we refer to as liquid biopsies. And again, you're going to hear more about this from Dr. Sequist um, and others today. But uh, many of you may be familiar with this technology. Um, and here the idea is that cancers, many different cancers, including lung cancer, can shed their DNA into the circulation. And if we have sensitive enough technologies, we can detect the circulating DNA, and we can actually sequence it and perform other tests to understand the different genetic alterations that may have occurred in the cancer. And you can imagine that this is really an incredible way to be able to monitor cancers without having to put patients through biopsies. These are just blood tests, um, not actually a biopsy like a CT guided lung biopsy, for example. And because of that, we can monitor at many time points, we call longitudinally over the course of treatments, and see how the cancer is changing or evolving in response to the treatments. And this can be an incredible opportunity to understand resistance, for example, as it emerges, and to be able to intervene at an earlier time point. Um, so this is a slide summarized or showing sort of the, the, the point that I want to make that the cancer cells, they themselves can shed into the blood and be detected as circulating tumor cells. But where we've seen a lot of success recently is actually, as I said, being able to detect the DNA of the cancer cell itself. Um, and I think Leisha will speak to both of these technologies and how we can use this both in the setting of monitoring response and resistance to therapies, and also potentially thinking about using these platforms in terms of early detection of lung cancer in patients who are not known to have lung cancer. I also wanted to mention how revealing these types of liquid biopsies have been in terms of um, showing us that cancers are really complicated. And I think Alicia and Justin and Aaron as well will speak to this, this idea of heterogeneity meaning that although we talk about cancers having EGFR or having ALK or having ROS1, you know, these cancers really are quite a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I would say in, in the beginning, even when someone is newly diagnosed, there already are differences, slight differences among the bulk of the cancer cells. And as we've been doing these liquid biopsies, what we've seen in some cases is that as patients go through different treatments, while these treatments can be effective for periods of time, at the end of you know, multiple treatments, we often have a very, very complicated heterogeneous tumor, not just with that original oncogenic driver like EGFR, but with that as well as many other changes. Um, and I've kind of symbolized that here by this colorful sort of ball of, of a sphere of balls. These are become really complicated tumors, and you can imagine that the more complicated and heterogeneous these tumors are, the more challenging they are for us to really treat well. And so I think what we've been focused on is really trying to understand the heterogeneity, where it comes from, what's driving it, and can we act earlier on to prevent patients' cancers from becoming this heterogeneous. 
And then the third and final point I want to make before we open the panel discussion is um, about immunotherapy. And I think many of you, if not all of you, have heard about the enormous successes of immunotherapy just the last several years. Um, this is just an example of the cover of science um, a few years back, uh, really, I think, highlighting to everyone that this is, real, is a huge breakthrough for patients um, with all different types of cancer. And many of you may know that the way these immunotherapies work is by unleashing the immune system to recognize and fight the cancer. Um, and so we, um, uh, many, many uh, groups have been working on these new, this new class of drugs. We are beginning to understand more about them. We know that in lung cancer, not all patients respond to immunotherapies. It's probably about a, a subset, 20%, 25% whose cancers are very responsive to these new immunotherapies. And part of that has to do with the um, genetic changes that have happened in these cancers that over time can make these cancers um, more easily recognized by the immune system. And Justin Gaynor is going to speak a lot to this. You know, can we identify patients who are more likely to respond to immunotherapies? And what are those biomarkers of response? How can we understand them and how can we now use them clinically? These new drugs, as you may know, like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and um, there are many of these now, they really work by interrupting communication between the cancer cells and the immune system. Um, in, many, in many cases, the cancer cells actually are sort of actively suppressing the immune system to prevent the immune system from recognizing it. We know that one of the important mediators of that is this PD-1, PD-L1 communication. Many of these drugs are PD-L1, PD-L1, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, so they block that communication, and that's how the immune system can now be activated to recognize the cancer. And so before I turn and have our panelists come up, I just wanted to um, show this uh, sort of uh, I would say a map of the evolution of lung cancer therapies, where we have come from and where we're going. Um, this actually starts back in 1990 when we had very, very few of any therapies at all for patients with lung cancer. And of course, um, we have had chemotherapy, that's a standard therapy. We've had better and better chemotherapies over the years. Fortunately, we now have a whole array of targeted therapies that help um, many of our patients. Um, and now more recently, we have added immunotherapies as well to our armamentarium of therapies. And up here you can see, um, this is what, we're, what we are already seeing, um, this trajectory in terms of survival. And what we're seeing is, I would say, a definite correlation between these new therapies, these new discoveries, and patients living longer and longer. And I purposely wrote here that we don't even know how long patients can live now because we have so many different options. And that actually is a really good thing thing that we're not able to prognosticate as well now as we were you know 20 years ago when we had almost no options all right so why don't we have um, Leisha and Aaron and Justin come up um, and I guess this won't be in any particular order but maybe we'll start with um, Leisha if that's okay um, so just to introduce Leisha uh, many of you know her already, uh, but Leisha is the Landry Family Associate Professor of Medicine in the field of medical oncology here and at HMS. And she's also the director of our new Center for Innovation in Early Cancer Detection, so she'll speak to some of to your question. Um, and as you guys know, Leisha has really made seminal discoveries in the field of EGFR mutant lung cancer, so we will be talking about that and also talking about her, her new efforts um, to lead this early um, cancer detection uh, uh, work here at MGH. So, Leisha. Thanks, Alice. I think um, what we had thought of doing was um, just quickly giving you a one or two minute overview of the kinds of research we do, and we want to leave a lot of time for questions. So. Um, very briefly, I'm Leisha Sequist. I'm one of the thoracic oncology doctors here, and my research focus over the last 10 years has been on EGFR, one of these branches of targeted uh, therapies and lung cancer uh, treatments. So um, uh, Alice highlighted a lot of the types of work that we've, we've done already. And I would say going forward over the next 10 years, um, I'm going to be still very interested in EGFR and taking care of EGFR patients, but also shifting my focus of research a little bit towards early detection and some of the new technologies that are emerging. Um, 
uh, many of them blood-based, but also um, some of them radiological, some of them for lung cancer might be breath-based, and for other cancers, um, other types of innovative ways to look at uh, patients who don't have a diagnosis of cancer and see if we can find these things earlier. Because one thing that's been true since the beginning of, of time about cancer is the earlier you find it, the better people do, um, especially if it's at a, a time where it can be uh, surgically removed in total and taken out of the body. And so that's really our goal is to try and help prevent people from getting diagnosed with cancer that, that's at the stage where it's no longer curable. So we're hoping to collaborate um, both across the whole hospital here, which is, you know, a very big institution, the biggest hospital in Massachusetts. We have researchers from all different disciplines, surgery, radiology, general medicine, um, who are very interested in these types of things, but also take advantage of where we sit in the Boston community with all kinds of, um, you know, other academic institutions where there's brilliant engineers that are coming up with new ideas and there's biotechs that are coming up with new tools. And so we're really hoping to take advantage of our location here and try and bring together some, some new things and use, use the patients that walk through the door of, of Mass General Hospital as, as our assistants in, in testing some of these uh, new technologies and seeing what they can do. The next person is um, Dr. Justin Gaynor, and um, again, many of you may know him already, but he is a leader in the field of targeted therapies, um, having worked with us now, I think, for about seven, eight years um, on targeted therapies, but actually, more recently, has really become a leader in the field of immunotherapies. Um, and Justin also is, um, like, like all of us, a member of thoracic oncology and, and recently actually approved to be assistant professor. So, Justin. Uh, th thanks for the introduction. So. Um, I think if we look back the, in the, the, the 20th century, one of the greatest scientific advances really was vaccines, right? Our ability to overcome infectious disease. Got rid of smallpox, polio is no longer a public menace. Um, and I think vaccines show us the power of the immune system, right? If we think about it, the vaccines that, that we received as children are protecting us to this day. And it speaks to the power of the immune system that it has memory. Right? The, those vaccines you receive can, can last decades. So what if we can harness the same power of the immune system and instead target cancer instead of infectious disease? Now, soon after the success against infectious disease, that, those were some of the early attempts trying to use vaccines. And, and we soon realized that it's much harder to do that against cancer. But I would say in the last 20 years, we, we've gained a much deeper understanding of how the immune system works. And we've re recognized that the immune system, just like your cars, have gas pedals, have brakes. And there's more than one. Um, and if we can actually go after the brakes. So uh, Dr. Shaw showed uh, on, on one of our slides, you know, this PD-1 axis, which is essentially one of the brakes on the immune system. And if we can deliver drugs that block one of those break, that break, uh, we can get the immune system to go and, and hopefully allow it to go against the cancer. And this has been a really exciting time. Uh, the initial descriptions of using these novel immune therapies, we call them checkpoint inhibitors, really were just published in 2012. Okay? And within five years of that initial phase one study, we now have three of these drugs approved in lung cancer. And I think what's most impressive is that uh, in the fall of, of 2016, uh, the first study, a head-to-head -head comparison of using immunotherapy versus chemotherapy in a subset of patients uh, was a positive study uh, where the immunotherapy worked better than our traditional gold standard, which was chemotherapy. Um, and so that's really transformed the field. The other thing I'd like to point out is, is we, we retur will return to a lot the, the pie chart of showing those genetic mutations in lung cancer. And um, while targeted therapies can really be transformative, um, it's only if you have one of those genetic alterations, right? How, how do we approach people with lung cancer who don't have one of those genetic alterations? What should we do for those patients? And really, that, that's where immunotherapy has really, um, really shown to be a great benefit in that we're, we're seeing that these drugs are active not just if you have a genetic alteration, but in people who don't have those mutations. 
One of the major challenges, though, and, and something that, that we're particularly interested in here is how to identify who's most likely to respond to these drugs. We know that when they work, they work well, but, but they don't work in everyone. As Dr. Shaw mentioned, about 20 to 25 percent of people. Um, and when they do work, though, we produce much more durable responses than we've historically seen with things like chemotherapy. And so one of our major efforts here at MGH, uh, we're actually uh, leading a, a Stand Up to Cancer Dream Team, and one of our major initiatives under that team is really trying to identify what are the determinants of response to these drugs. And we're trying to do that in a number of ways, and, and it starts with trying to study the, the cancer itself. We're, we're looking at uh, what are the mutations that, that may predict it, what, what does the immune system look like in these cancers, um, and our hope is also to use blood-based tests. You know, right now we're, we're talking about these three big topics, but they overlap a lot. So we're, we're using blood-based tests to also see if that can provide insights into who's going to respond. And also, we're, we're looking at when patients develop resistance to these drugs, how does that happen? So I think uh, there's a lot of crosstalk for a lot of the topics that you'll be hearing about today. Thanks, Justin. Um, and then the third uh, panelist I just want to introduce you to is Aaron Hada. And Aaron uh, actually was with Jeff Engelman as a postdoc um, and then joined our faculty last summer. And he has really been leading all of the basic research efforts that support our group, um, both in targeted therapies as well as immunotherapy. Aaron. So um, as Alice said, I represent sort of the science half of the, the team. And when I say part of the team, I really do believe that the science is part of the same team as what's happening in the clinic. Um, and we are about 15 people um, in my group. Um, we're located over in the Charlestown Navy Yard. And then about 10 people under Dr. Cyril Benist, who uh, leads the Center for Molecular Therapeutics. And they're really focused on um, both developing cell lines from many of the patients that are treated here in the cancer center and then using high throughput robotic um, platforms to screen drugs and combinations of drugs to try to find new combinations of drugs that might work against um, resistant cancers and the cell lines that are developed from our patients. Um, and, you know, sort of our mission is really to bring the latest scientific tools um, to answer the questions that we have from the clinical trials that we're running um, and, and trying to figure out what are the mechanisms that can explain some of the things that we're seeing um, in our patients. Um, and I think, you know, from a conceptual and from a practical standpoint, what we really try to do is to close the gap between the lab and the clinic. Um, and we do that both by um, trying to move our science closer to the clinic. Um, so we, for a number of years, we've had a big effort to try to take biopsies from patients, grow the cells in the lab, and then do um, science using those models instead of cell lines that might be available that aren't really very relevant to the questions we're trying to ask. Um, and then what we're also trying to do is we work very closely with Justin and with Leisha and the other clinicians to try to build in our science into the clinical trials that are happening so that we can ask those questions in the context of seeing how patients are responding to the drugs. Um, and I think this is really important because historically what usually happened was Scientists would be in the lab, they'd study something, they'd have an idea. They would go to the clinicians and say, can we look at some clinical samples, can we look at some pathology samples and see if what we saw in the lab might be relevant to what's happening in the clinic. And then if they see something promising, then they'll say, oh, we should develop a clinical trial. And that may take a really long time. Um, and what we want to do is to really ask those questions at the same time as we're designing the clinical trial so we can do it all at once so that when the clinical trial is done, we also have the science to understand what we're seeing, and then we can rapidly design new clinical trials. And I think, you know, Alice showed sort of the pace of how the pace of discovery can really be accelerated when the science and the, and the clinical work is really brought together. And so we're trying to really do that in a, in a thoughtful and strategic way. Um, so in terms of exactly what we're studying in the lab, some of the things that we're working on are things that are similar to what we've been working on for many years now. Um, for instance, why do cancers become resistant? What are the mutations um, that might happen? And what are some new drugs that might 
uh, target those new resistance mutations um, that we can bring back in the clinic. Um, we're very interested in trying to find drugs that work for KRAS. So in that pie chart that Alice showed, KRAS was the biggest piece of that pie. We've known about KRAS for a long time, um, but so far we've never been able to target it. And a lot of different things have tr been tried and failed, um, but now we have a whole new class of drugs that actually can directly target and shut down KRAS um, that we're studying in the lab. And so hopefully this is going to open up a whole new opportunity now to, to, to bring targeted drugs to patients with KRAS. Um, we're also doing some new things like um, looking at new drivers. So those different parts of the pie, we're continually finding new uh, mutations and getting new drugs. We've also become really interested in trying to figure out are there ways that we can actually understand how resistance is happening so that we could design drugs that might actually stop the process. So rather than seeing why the patient is resistant, can we actually prevent it from happening in the first place? And then I think an area that's really exciting for us but also challenging is how can we understand from a scientific perspective some of the new immunotherapies. And this is actually stimulating a lot of new collaborations um, with immunologists and people that we haven't traditionally collaborated with to help us understand how not just the tumor is responding to the drugs but also the immune system. Um, and so I think this is it's really exciting because now we're having to think of a completely new um, uh, area that's impacting um, cancer. And so I think this is going to be really important in the next five to ten years to really start understanding that and, and, and make these immunotherapies work even better than they already are. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so maybe I'll start off. And of course, like I said, please uh, chime in. Uh, I think I'll start, Alicia, with a question about early detection to kind of get um, more sort of detail about uh, what you were asking. You know, there's a lot of excitement about early detection. You mentioned specifically if we can detect lung cancer earlier, we're going to have a greater impact, a better chance actually of curing the disease. Maybe you can give us a little bit of context about how right now we do use CAT scans um, to screen patients who are high risk, but then what's sort of, what's the vision for the future, particularly related to the blood tests? Yeah. So until um, about five years ago, there was no such way to screen for lung cancer. They had, in the 1980s or 1990s, they had looked at whether chest x-rays could be used and um, various older techniques, and, it, and none of them seemed to really be able to pick up enough lung cancers to make any sort of difference to recommend doing it wide scale on the population. About five years ago, there was a large clinical trial that, that read out looking at CAT scans. And for the first time, we did have a scientifically proven way to find lung cancer early, and patients survived longer when they were screened with CAT scans than when they weren't. Um, so this has been a huge advance in the field, and now this is something that is um, you know, paid for by Medicare and being done in, in all the hospitals around the country. But some caveats with um, the current CAT scan paradigm is that one, the study was only done in people with a very heavy smoking history. Now on the one hand this makes sense because um, having a very high smoking history is certainly a risk factor for lung cancer. So those, those people would be considered to be at high risk. Uh, but there are lots of people, as Alice had talked about, that, that have a lower smoking history or a never smoking history who are at risk for lung cancer. Um, uh, and we don't have any sort of screening modality for folks like that. The second caveat with CAT scans is that our imaging techniques are so good nowadays that yes, we pick up early cancers, but we also pick up a lot of findings that are not cancer. And um, in fact, most of the expense and uh, patient time and um, patient procedures that uh, people have to go through after having a screening CAT scan, things like repeat scans, maybe biopsies, the anxiety of all of this, most, most people who are going through all of that end up not having cancer. So of all of the positive findings, only a small minority of those findings turn out to be cancer. So we need, um, we need some adjunctive tests to add on to the CAT scan. Things that might help us say, even though there's a little schmutz there in the lung, that's probably not a cancer, or this one probably is a cancer. And also some tests that might be applicable for people who have a lower smoking history and don't meet that threshold to qualify for screening lung CT at this time. So we're hoping that um, 
blood-based technologies might be one way to um, improve the current paradigm. And um, there are several new technologies that are emerging uh, and we don't know yet which one may be best suited or if a combination of some of these different technologies may be best suited. So it's one of the first projects we're pursuing in our new center um, for early detection. And uh, we're currently um, in the runoff to uh, p potentially receive some funding from Stand Up to Cancer to look at um, a population of patients who are being screened for lung cancer uh, and use some of these blood-based technologies to see if we can improve upon uh, both um, our ability to say which patients might have cancer and which patients probably don't so that we can be more accurate. Um, so we're looking at both circulating tumor cells in the blood as well as the circulating DNA in the blood and also maybe looking at some circulating proteins in the blood to try and see if um, if these tools individually or together as a uh, combination test might be helpful. Can you use that also to try and determine when targeted medications are starting to get resistance? Yes, so that is uh, one thing that um, a lot of people have seen and, and we've done a lot of work on that here with various uh, targeted therapies that are being studied EGFR, ALK, ROS, MET, HER2, a lot of our patients we follow serially with plasma tests and it's looking like, I mean, the, the results aren't final by any means yet, but the early indications are that you can really monitor in a quantitative way when patients' tumors are shrinking and importantly, you may be able to see when resistance is starting to come out, sometimes even before the CAT scans show resistance. Um, one of the, one of the, you know, we, we've learned a lot about how cancers get resistance through biopsies, and, and Alice has mentioned this, and Aaron told you a little bit about how we've taken patients' biopsies and tried to grow them in the lab to really have models to study, but one of the downsides of doing these biopsies is that you are only sampling one tiny microscopic area of tumor. Um, Within, within a mass, and then sometimes patients have different spots in different parts of their body, and you're not sampling those with a biopsy. So one of the potential benefits of um, blood-based testing is that you might be able to get a broader spectrum sampling of what's going on in different parts of the cancer throughout a patient's body. Um, so we're hoping that um, by using these different tools to look at different aspects, we can get a better idea of when is resistance coming up, how does it happen, and then that hopefully will shine a light on how we can stop it. Anisha, just to get back to early detection a little bit, you know, other than blood tests and CT scans, there are even other, um, I think, technologies that you're looking at, um, including a breath-based yeah. test, so maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Yeah, one of the ones that we're really excited about right now, because it's getting uh, set to open uh, probably in about a month, is looking at um, a technology that was developed at MIT where um, uh, it's, it's analyzing the volatile organic compounds that come out with each exhale um, and um, the composition of these compounds may be different in someone who has a tumor in their lung, a cancer growing versus someone who doesn't. And so we're looking at exhaled breath on a, on a um, exhaled onto a card that has some very high-tech uh, digital stuff built into it to try and see if that can um, help us read out um, the difference between people with cancer and, the d and people who don't have cancer, and then can we detect it early? And uh, not only is this really cool, easy, non-invasive, but you can imagine that it's something that could really be used around the world in places that don't have access to expensive CAT scan machines and um, things like this. So. And just given everything you've been researching, I mean, what's your vision in five or 10 years? Um, do you think we're gonna have sort of more routine testing using blood, for example, for early detection, using one of these novel technologies? I think so. I mean, I've been doing um, research with blood-based technologies for about 10 years now, and definitely the first five to eight years of those 10 years, it was something that was very idealistic. It was really cool to study in the lab, but not that practical in the clinic. And um, just over the last couple of years, I think the technology advances have finally gotten to the place where 
these sorts of things really can be used every day in the clinic. And in fact, for patients with metastatic lung cancer, there's already two FDA-approved plasma-based tests. Um, looking at EGFR mutations and then an EGFR resistance mutation. So I, I do think it's realistic to think that within a five-year timeline, some of these tests might move um, from patients with more widely spread disease to people who don't have a diagnosis of cancer. I think one of the big hurdles is that um, obviously the volume of cancer in a patient who, who has an early stage cancer is pre-diagnosis, it's much less. So you really need something that can really find that needle in the haystack. Um, but I think the technology is getting there. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing because that technology may one day hopefully become available to all, all people, not just patients who are viewed as high risk. Exactly. Um, so Justin, um, just some thoughts about immunotherapy. I mean, I think we've been so excited about nivolumab and pembrolizumab, but you know, the majority of patients actually are not responding to those single drugs. And I'm just curious if you could give us some insight into what do we need to do better so that more patients hopefully will gain benefit from these immunotherapy approaches. Yeah, so, so I, th I think the first thing we need to do better is, is first get a survey uh, of what is the landscape of the immune system in the tumors. Um, you know, initially when we were studying, you know, developing these pie charts uh, of, you know, what are the mutations in, in tumors um, that help guide targeted therapy, that's where we started with just creating an atlas, you know, the cancer genome atlas of what are the mutations in common cancers. I think now uh, we have to take that a step further and ask not just the mutations in a tumor, but also what is the immune environment around it. So I think we need to get a better understanding of, of what the immune system looks like. You know, and now we're not just studying the tumor, we're also studying the host. Um, and I think right now we're just scratching the surface of that. I, I think our understanding is still quite rudimentary. So I, I think. Understanding is, is the first step, and, and there certainly are efforts to create a, 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 an immunological atlas of, of cancers, and I think lung cancer is, is certainly high on that list. The other thing I, I think we have to understand, and, and we're starting to see these trials enter the clinics, are, you know, I use this analogy of brake, you know, gas pedals and brakes, and that these drugs are targeting one of the brakes. Well, there's more than one, um, and I think one of the uh, places that we're looking at, well, if, if someone's, not all patients respond to one break, what about the others? Um, can we start combining uh, drugs that, that block multiple breaks, or uh, should we be targeting the gas pedals? We call these co-stimulatory molecules. And so I think over the next, kind of my vision of the next five years, is we're gonna be seeing a lot more combination studies where we're evaluating combinations of uh, multiple co-inhibitory molecules or co-inhibitory, co-stimulatory molecule, um, or combining modalities. So keeping one immune therapy and adding things like radiation. Can we make, or chemotherapy, or targeted therapy, can, can we actually, um, use those combinations to make things work better and, and increase the number of patients who are responding. I think what we've quickly learned is that it, it may not be as simple as combine A plus B. Um, that uh, taking two drugs that, that right now you know appear to be well tolerated when you combine them together, uh, we can see unexpected side effects. And so I think as a field, we need to think more critically and develop more novel clinical trial design so that we can rapidly evaluate combinations that are promising um, and put aside uh, combinations that have too much toxicity. I think what we've seen a fair amount from the clinical trials and even our own experience is that patients with a lighter smoking history or never smoking history or our EGFR Alcross patients, are th those are patients who don't seem to respond to these uh, the current immunotherapies that right. we have. And so, Justin, you've done some work to try and understand why that is. Maybe you can uh, summarize sure. that for us. Sure. So I, I think it begins with, with this premise that, you know, um, Cancers, the way cancers develop is, is really they, they acquire a number of mutations, right? And if we think about it, a mutation is just a change in the DNA. And with each mutation, suddenly the cancer cell can start to look more foreign to your immune system, right? If, if it's a acquired 200 mutations, suddenly it, it, it looks more unique. 
Um, and that's what allows the immune system to, to recognize a cancer. Is it just looks more foreign uh, compared to, to the normal cells. What, what, we've, what we've learned from, from um, both other people's studies and, and ours is that we know that, uh, so we've learned that you know, smoking is a powerful carcinogen, and, and by that we mean it just leads to the development of more mutations. So, um, and mutations like EGFR, ALK, these are, these are alterations that are found in people who are never smokers. So they have, even though they have that one kind of powerful oncogene, um, the, the number of other mutations in the cancer is actually much, much less compared to a typical smoking-induced cancer. And so those cancers look less foreign to the immune system. And when we've, when we've looked at, and we've just underneath the microscope with one of our, our great uh, pathologists here, we, we found that just the number of immune cells around those cancers appear much lower compared to typical smoking-induced cancers. And we think that's one of the reasons why those subsets may not be responding as well to the immunotherapies. And Justin, what about um, immunotherapy? And we've talked a lot about non-small cell lung cancer, but what about small cell lung cancer where we know there is a higher mutational burden? Do you envision that immunotherapies will also become a standard part um, or even a first-line therapy for small cell lung cancer? Yeah, so that, that's a great point. So if, if we actually, um, the first thing to, to note is that these immunotherapies, one, one of the, the reasons why there's excitement is they work not just in lung cancer. In fact, uh, they're, they've now shown activity in over 20 different types of cancer. So think of this as, as a new tool to insert in the toolbox of oncology in general. But what we've noticed is that if, if you look at the cancers where these drugs have shown the most activity, these have been cancers that have typically had more mutations. So the uh, prototypical cancers are things like melanoma, right, UV-induced DNA damage. Lung cancer, um, esophageal cancer, bladder cancer, these are cancers that have had a lot of mutations. Now, a small cell um, is found is 10 to 15 percent of lung cancer, and as Alice mentioned, this is a cancer that typically has a lot of mutations. Um, what's been a little bit so these drugs have shown activity in small cell um, in two preliminary studies, um, which has gotten a lot of excitement. Um, but just like in non-small cell lung cancer, it, it seems like it's a, it's a percentage, it's a subgroup of people. And in those studies, it's 10 to 20% of people. And I think we need to understand what is it about those 10 to 20% of people because you know, small cell lung cancers typically have a lot of mutations. Uh, my sense is that one of the reasons why that number isn't 100% of patients responding may be how these cancers are presenting themselves to the immune system. Uh, you know, cancers, I think one common theme is you know, cancers are complex and, and they can evade the immune system. And one of the ways that they can evade the immune system is suddenly they just stop expressing normal proteins on their surface that, that other cells are required to have that, that basically present themselves to the immune system. And so small cell lung cancers can downregulate that. Now, there are a couple novel immune therapies that, that can get around that, that can take advantage of that, and that's something that we're sure. actually actively exploring, uh, trying to exploit uh, what they're using to get around the immune system. So Aaron, I have a question for you too. Um, you have done some really beautiful work um, studying the evolutionary origin of resistance um, in EGFR mutant lung cancer and now in other lung cancers as well. And I was wondering if you could just um, maybe describe that a little bit, but also put it in the perspective of, of clinical care and really how can that um, how can that biology really inform us in terms of how we are managing patients? Sure. So um, you know, I think. We focused a lot over the years on <coughs> when cancers respond and then grow back, looking to see when the cancer comes back, we can figure out what mutations are there or what mechanism caused that, that, that cancer to come back. Um, and, and, and we do that by comparing that resistant cancer to the tumor at diagnosis. And 
looking to see what's different. Um, and so, in essence, what we're getting is two snapshots in time. But what we don't know is what happened in between. Were those resistant cells there at the very beginning and it was just a matter of time before they happened to come out? Or were they not there? The cancer responded, but some cells survived and then they changed along the way and then they, the cancer came back. And we can't answer that question because we've never really been able to look along the way. Um, and so in the lab over the last couple of years, we've tried to study this. And what we've seen is that you can actually get that resistant tumor coming back both ways. Sometimes those cells are there at the beginning. They're just hiding. Um, but sometimes they're not there. And they actually acquire changes along the way and then come out. And, and so when we think about what do we do about resistance and ask the question, are there things we can do earlier before the resistance develops? Understanding how this process happens becomes really important because if those cancer cells are there at the beginning, then we'd want a drug at the very beginning that can target them and prevent them from growing out. If in fact they're changing, maybe we can understand why they're changing and use something else early before that process happens. And so, you know, we've studied this in the lab, but I think the next challenge for us is really to try to understand what's happening in patients. Um, and are there ways that we can, and we can do this? And so um, one of the things that we've started to think about are, are there ways that we can integrate biopsies or blood samples for our patients that are on trials to be able to look at those early time points and to be able to look at cells, um, look at DNA in the blood to try to see some of these early changes and learn, and learn better what's happening. Um, and there's... Uh, a lot of new technologies that are available now where you, we can actually um, examine individual tumor cells um, from a biopsy um, and look for mutations and look for genes that might be expressed or not expressed that might tell us what's happening. Um, and so I think that our hope is that, you know, as we get a better understanding of what's happening, we'll be able to um, have ideas about how we might be able to add on another drug actually before the cancer comes back, um, and so that we can prevent that process from resistance from even happening in the first place. And Aaron, you know, as a basic researcher, um, you know, your lab is funded by the NIH, a large part of it. Um, and so I wonder if you could just comment a little bit on NIH funding, and I would say in particular, given the potential for upcoming cuts to the NIH budget that have been proposed, and what do you, you know, what do you as a basic researcher envision that impact would be if we had, uh, I think it was an $18 billion cut? Something, Something like that, yes. So, I mean, I think we all, um, have a sense that you know the the NIH is is under pressure um, to keep their budgets in line, um, and we also know that the costs of research are going up, so that the actual dollars that we get from the NIH don't accomplish as much as they used to, just because it's more ex expensive to do the research. Um, and you know, just to put some numbers, you know, sort of the the funding rates for a grant that you put into the NIH is somewhere between six and 10%. Mm. So that's out of 100 grants that people apply for, maybe 10 of those get funded. Um, so we're in a challenging time. I think um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're doing the most impactful, the most important research. Um, and, uh, but you know, when we hear about proposals to cut the, to cut the budget by um, you know, billions of dollars, it does cause us to get concerned because um, I think we feel like you know, we've got a lot of momentum, we've had a lot of progress, um, and uh, we worry that you know, if, if the budgets are cut significantly, that could really have a, 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 a devastating effect on all this momentum that's been, been um, building up. So I, I think we don't really know what it's going to look like, and hopefully it, it's not going to be um, as bad as that, um, but you know, I think we always have to be, you know, um, we have to advocate it for, for what we believe in and that should show people that we're, you know, making progress and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to be able to. 
Yeah, I mean, it would affect not just lung cancer research, but all cancer research. I would say all biomedical research um, in general. So it really has a in potential to impact, really have a dr drastic impact on, on our health care in, in general. Did you have a question? Yeah, there was a point um, where I, I thought the discussion was leading to a lung cancer discovery could also match into a breast cancer discovery. I mean, sometimes the research um, overlaps or something. Is yep. that still relevant? Yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think, you know, as Justin alluded to, the immunotherapies cross, um, but also with the mutation. So, for instance, a small piece of that, that, that pie of, of oncogenes is BRAF. So BRAF is very, it's not very common in lung cancer, but it's very common in melanoma. So 50% of melanomas have BRAF mutations. And so a lot of the work on BRAF inhibitors was, were, was done with melanoma. But now for lung cancer, we know that those therapies that were developed for melanoma can be useful for lung cancer. And there are some differences with some of these oncogenes depending on whether they're lung cancer or colon cancer or breast cancer. But because we know a lot from one cancer, when they're discovered in another, a lot of that information uh, can be used to, to extrapolate it to the other cancer. So there is a lot of, of back and forth between different cancer types that can benefit each other. Okay. Ed? Can I just ask oh. kind of a follow-up question there? When, when we talk about immunotherapy and targeted cancer therapy and things like that, a lot of that seemed to have began in, in like the thoracic cancer research. Is, is that a fair statement to make that, you know, when we talk about immunotherapy, a lot of that work in the beginning was done by lung cancer researchers? Is that a true statement? Or how can you Well, so certainly with targeted therapy, I, I think uh, targeted therapy, you know, lung cancer has been one of the, one of the paradigms where, where that has worked really well. Um, with immunotherapy, it's followed a, a convoluted past where, where you know, historically uh, it was melanoma and kidney cancer that where we thought that uh, you know, immunotherapies may have benefit. There, they were very nonspecific immunotherapies, things like IL-2. And we often, in those diseases at the time, there weren't many other therapies. And so it was really just, you know, focused on, on these cytokine-based therapies. And, and for a while, even though there were, there were efforts at, at using vaccines in lung cancer, lung cancer was considered a non-immunogenic cancer. And it was really in 2012, uh, I think it surprised everyone in the field where uh, a phase one study using one of these drugs called nivolumab actually showed responses in 18% of people with lung cancer. And that's what got everyone's attention. Um, and, and really from that moment on, I think everyone has, has been focusing on lung cancer as one of the areas where we're now actually is responsive to immunotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have heard at some point a while back there was an attempt to take tissue in the lab and test different medications on the tissue and then come up with therapy for the individual patient. But I didn't actually hear anyone specifically touch on it today. Is that still an ongoing thing and is being done here? And, and Aaron, can you speak to that? Yes, so, so that is, it is still an ongoing effort. Um, and you know, I think our hope is to be able to, like you said, to be able to actually test drugs on tissues and, and, and be able to have those results in, in a few weeks. Um, I think we're still a ways off from that. I think it's, uh, it's pretty ambitious, um, but there's a lot, still an ongoing effort in the lab. And um, now much of that work is being done with uh, Dr. Cyril Bennis, who I mentioned, who runs the Center for Molecular Therapeutics. Um, and he's really developing ways to be able to do more and more studies on fewer and fewer cells so that they can be done earlier and earlier. Um, and he's got a number of, of really cool um, systems to do that. And so and I can't really give you a timeline for when we're going to get there, but it still is definitely an area of, of interest.
All right, so I think we're going to close the panel. Um, I wanted to thank our panelists um, for uh, contributing today. Um, and of course, thank um, Carrie Powers and Development for allowing us to, to do this event, which I hope you found educational and helpful. We will be around if you have some extra questions. And of course, I wanted to thank all of you for actually coming on a Friday morning to hear about our research, and also many of you for supporting our research year after year. It really has been so vital to our program and to bringing these new advances um, to patients. So thank you very much. card is in your folder so if you think of questions after you leave today feel free to email me and I can pass it on um, to everyone up here and we can get you know, additional answers for you so thank you for coming thank you, thank you. Great to everybody here. Thank you.